Hello, and welcome to the UCIPM Urban and Community Webinar Series. I'm Belinda Messenger Sykes, Urban and Community Writer Editor with the University of California Statewide Integrated Pest Management Program. Thanks for joining us today. Today's talk will be about invasive species presented by Carrie Wimbill Rojas. Carrie is the Associate Director for Urban and Community IPM and Area Urban IPM Divisor for Yolo, Solano, and Sacramento counties. As Associate Director, Carrie provides leadership and coordinates communication and educational efforts to address pest issues around homes, structures, landscapes, gardens, schools, and public areas, and engages various clientele to serve these areas. Okay, thank you, Belinda and Elaine. And my slides <clears throat> should be up right now. Uh, so I'm going to go get started. We have quite a bit to discuss today. Um, we have determined that in the preparation for today's webinar on um, invasive pests and new pests in California, that there's really a lot to cover. So um, we determined that we are going to have today's presentation be a part one of invasive pests. And we will have a part two and poss possibly a part three uh, later on in the year. And we will announce um, when the part two is uh, at the end of the presentation today. Okay, so as, um, as mentioned, I'm Carrie Winbill Rojas from the University of California Statewide IPM program. And we do a lot of education on um, pest management for urban and community audiences one of which being the importance of invasive pests that come into California that may be here, may be coming, may be established, may not quite be here yet. So today I'm gonna to go over kind of why invasive pests are important and what they are and give you some examples and then show you some resources. All right, Annie, Lane and Belinda, you'll let me know if there's any problems with my slides, um, I assume, thank you. So to give a background um, about invasive pests um, in California, uh, you know, we've been moving in and, and around this country um, from um, other states and from other countries for hundreds of years. And people have um, historically brought plants and animals in with them, um, desirable plants that they might want to grow, new food crops, uh, perhaps pets, or sometimes accidentally having hitchhikers on plant material or vehicles or other materials. Uh, and so some of these plant and animal introductions have caused unexpected damage when they were found out that they're here, while others, especially the um, uh, possibly intentional food or horticultural crops have become naturalized and have become part of our California ecosystem and have not caused damage, but have actually been beneficial. So because a, a plant or an animal is from another place does not always make it invasive or exotic, um, but it could potentially cause problems. And we're gonna talk about some of that today. So uh, researchers have looked over the period of several hundred years and found that nearly 1700 non-native invertebrates, so animals without a vertebral column, um, have established in California. Of those, 84% of them were insects, followed by a small percentage of mites and some spiders. And that's just for the invertebrates. Today, I'll talk about other um, pest categories that have also been introduced into California <clears throat> over the, the years. And um, of those invertebrates, about 19% are considered pests now. And we do get new introductions of new pests every year. Um, that are either detected or not detected. And again, uh, I'll get into that. But the importance of invasive pests is that California agricultural loss due to damage um, by these pests can exceed $3 billion a year. And it's probably growing, um, but these are figures from the California Center for Invasive Species Research in Riverside and um, California Department of Food and Agriculture. So let's talk about what an exotic pest and an invasive pest is. An exotic um, organism, animal, plant is from a different location. So something that is not native to the local ecosystem. Something that is invasive, however, is uh, could be exotic and usually is from another place, but it's likely to 
um, spread and become a problem and cause environmental or economic uh, damage uh, in our, our natural ecosystem. So for example, one of these plants, the forsythia, is an exotic plant from a, another location that has become established in California, but it is not invasive. Whereas Scotch broom, the plant um, at the bottom middle, is uh, both exotic from another location and it is an invasive plant due to the way it spreads. And I'll, I'll also talk about how something becomes um, uh, invasive. So we care about invasive pests because they can be a threat to our agricultural crops and cause major economic uh, damage and consequences as in crop loss and, um, and uh, unavailability of some of the food that we grow. And California does grow a lot of different crops and food. Um, they can be a threat to our landscape and our garden plants by crowding out the things that we want to grow or by causing damage. You can see the Japanese beetle picture in the upper right. Um, the Japanese beetle, which largely is not in California, but um, there are some incidents. Uh, the beetle feeding, which you can see in the middle of that plant leaf, they can um, skeletonize or eat the majority of a plant leaf which can then lead to both aesthetic damage and also plant loss and damage, either for ornamentals or for crops. Um, and they threaten natural areas, our areas you know, that we enjoy, wildlands, um, and some plants such as scotch broom or star thistle or other weeds can invade a natural area and take over the natural flora and fauna and displace some of the um, natural organisms there, which is not good for our native landscape. And so um, by trying to manage these pests, often we have to use pesticides and that might disrupt the natural ecosystem and of course our integrated pest management programs where we're not trying to use pesticides as our, our first line of defense. So there are many problems associated with invasive pests. There are different categories of pests, as you well know from studying integrated pest management, and it's the same for anything that is an exotic pest or an invasive pest. We have uh, plant pathogens that can be invasive pests, such as Dutch elm disease that is spread by a certain bark beetle and then can um, infect the plant and cause a plant to die. Um, there are weeds, and I will get into some of the weeds today, but possibly part two or three, we'll talk more specifically about weeds, but there are aquatics and also um, uh, uh, terrestrial weeds that can be damaging to an area. Um, there are uh, other aquatic species such as um, mussels that can be moved on, on boats and other um, water vessels that can clog um, uh, pipes and drains and also disturb the natural ecosystem. And then as I mentioned in the first slide, there are many types of invertebrates or insects um, in particular that we have as invasive species and some of which I'll, I'll cover today. Uh, and of course, vertebrates. Um, can't forget the, the vertebrate pests. Those are the larger animals. Um, we have wild pigs in California there are invasive uh, fish species. And what's pictured here is nutria, which is an aquatic um, um, uh, rodent uh, that I'll have a picture of later. You can see it's nice big teeth. And there are others, of course. So these are just our categories of invasive pests. So I mentioned also in the first slide how pests get here. We bring them from place to place um, through our traveling and through either intentional or unintentional um, export or movement. So invasive pests can get here through our interstate commerce as trucks and uh, vehicles move goods from place to place. Um, uh, we get a lot of invasive pest interception at our uh, ports, um, especially down in Long Beach and Southern California, where we have some of the, ma the major uh, ports of commerce um, and also in um, the Stockton area in the Bay Area. They can move with our luggage and hitchhike on cars. As you can see in this middle picture, there are um, egg cases, egg masses of um, 
the moth limantria that are attached to this wheel. And obviously, you know, they're not seen by the driver. It's only through inspection that they might be found or later as they move into the landscape, they're discovered um, and hopefully before they disperse too much. But we can move them on our, our household items as we relocate ourselves from state to state or vacation or move or anything. Um, invasive uh, pests are often moved on nursery stock as plants that are grown in other states or other countries um, come into California. And sometimes the life stage of the, um, the pest, especially insects, are really hard to detect. If there is an egg, um, a single egg or an egg case that's um, under a leaf or inside a stem or in the soil, it may be really difficult to impossible to see. And then the nursery stock gets moved into our, our retail stores and then the pest gets dispersed. Um, also through the movement of firewood. Firewood can contain certain um, uh, wood boring pests and bark beetles. And um, you can imagine other kinds of movements. So there's many easy ways for invasive pests to get around. So when a new invasive pest is discovered uh, in an area, oftentimes that, that invaded area or the locale is quarantined, depending on how serious the pest um, is known to be. Sometimes we don't know much about it until um, we find it and then do some, some research into its origin. Um, Often eradication efforts will be carried out by some of our regulatory departments, such as the California Department of Food and Agriculture or the United States Department of Agriculture um, in combination with the California County Ag Commissioners. And so everybody works together to try and um, eradicate certain pests that um, are more problematic than, than other invasives. Uh, some of the infested plant material in nearby areas might need to be sprayed with a pesticide to get rid of the uh, invasive pest so that it doesn't spread. And there is often an area-wide effort by these agencies to conduct that where they go from house to house or farm to farm um, and, um, and spray with pesticides. Or sometimes they just remove the whole plant or the whole tree. Um, often the, the nurseries and ag producers are unable to ship plant material from place to place. And so again, that disrupts our commerce and um, causes us to have uh, economic issues. <clears throat> and then if a plant has been inspected or has been quarantined, uh, some of the regulatory agencies will put a tag on them at retail stores so that you know um, whether it's a safe plant that has been um, treated or inspected or comes from um, a, a facility where they've, they've done um, uh, some regulation on making sure that the plant is clean to be moved. So lots of different activities have to go into uh, either eradicating or getting rid of an uh, invasive pest. Um, sometimes there is no quarantine or eradication for some pests, either because it's, it's not uh, something that can be done, either from cost or the economic loss is not considered great enough to go through the effort. And so there are only a few uh, pests within California that are under eradication efforts by uh, CDFA and, and the other agencies. Some pests are already too well established to become um, an uh, eradication effort um, focus. And I'll talk about some of those in a little bit. And depending on the pest, some are not good candidates for a quarantine or eradication program. But it does still mean that we need to take precautions so that we can help limit the spread of these pests that may not be under any kind of quarantine or eradication program. So here is on this slide um, a short list of some of the invasive pests of California that we are concerned with. I will <clears throat> talk about some of these today, but certainly not all. And um, some are, are well established. As you can see, giant white fly, it is still considered invasive, but 
we have it throughout California and it's been spreading for a number of years. Um, Polyphica shot hole borer, which I'll talk about in a little bit, is a very small beetle that's been moving um, throughout the state over the years. And some of these um, insects and diseases are pests mainly for landscapes and wooded areas, natural areas that we're concerned of. And some have um, host plants that are grown as food crops. And, <clears throat> and so that they can be a problem with the, um, the loss, potential loss of, of our, our crops. And then we have for ornamental species, some of the weeds that I mentioned like brooms and feather grasses, which can be a problem in our wildlands. Um, there are invasive species that are um, uh, public health concerns, <clears throat> certain species of mosquitoes, red imported fire ants, um, the brown widow spider, and Africanized bees and others. And I'm not gonna talk about those today. And then of course we have aquatic species, which I will mention. So this is just a partial list. There are many, many others. And, and as I said, we have new species that threaten to invade California um, every day. So let's get into some of the pests. And some of these you may recognize, some may be new to you. And um, all of these are things we are still concerned about. Even if you've been hearing about them for many years, they're still considered invasive and we want to try to reduce their spread, limit the, the damage, and uh, in some cases, even eradicate them. So the first one I'll talk about is the Asian citrus psyllid. Asian citrus psyllid, also uh, called ACP, is a very small plant sucking psyllid insect. It's about the size of an aphid, and it has the potential to spread a bacterium that causes uh, plant disease called Wang Wang Bing or HLB. And so the psyllid, which you can see the adult here, the adult feeds on the sap of the plant um, with a needle-like mouth part sucking out plant juices. And through that, that feeding, that needle-like mouth part can also transmit this disease. And, <clears throat> and the disease, um, HLB, can cause this um, discoloration of leaves, this blotchy yellow modeling of leaves, but more importantly, it can kill a citrus tree or related plant in within five years. And there's uh, research being done to try and um, uh, uh, cure the disease or uh, reduce the, the disease uh, in trees, but currently, um, infection by HLB is um, leading to death of the plant. And so it is spreading throughout California, as you can see this uh, distribution map, and we will have resources to show you where to go for more information. Um, where this little red area is around Long Beach, if you can see, that's where the disease HLB has been found and they are trying to um, conduct eradication efforts to get rid of that plant material but the, the, um, the psyllid itself is spreading in various places in California. So what you can do is look at the young plant tissue, the um, Asian citrus psyllid nymphs, especially, they like to feed on the new citrus growth. And what they do is they feed and as they, um, they, um, <clears throat> they feed, they produce honeydew as their excrement and the honeydew looks like these waxy white tubules. So you often won't see this very small nymph um, or immature psyllid. What you'll see is the sign of them being there. And this is a pretty heavy infestation. You may not see all this mess. You might just see a few tubules. And the adults, this is how they feed. They, they, they feed at an angle. Um, they kind of stick their rear end up as they feed on the plant. And they're really very small. Um, and the, oops, the uh, nymphs are hard to see. So if you uh, have a citrus tree in your backyard, please do uh, investigate, look at the new growth. And if you do um, find any signs of ACP, <clears throat> see if you're in a quarantine area and report it to your, um, your local uh, California Ag Commissioner, County Ag Commissioner. We do have a resource and we'll share all of these links with you later on 
what to do, how to find them, and um, more information on where the, the Asian citrus psyllid is. For all the pests that I'll talk about today, we do have a resource to share with you. And don't think that you need to write down all of the websites because there are a lot. We will be sharing them with you at the end of um, the, the presentation today and in, in a follow-up email. All right, moving on to another pest that attacks trees. Sudden oak death is a disease that mainly attacks California live oak, black oak, and uh, Shreve's oak, as well as tan oak. <clears throat> they are trunk, um, uh, uh, sorry, it is a disease of trunks. Um, and there are other species as well that it attacks, but it just may not kill those trees. And this is a quarantine pest. Um, the infected trees cannot be cured. So if you suspect it, you call your um, county agricultural commissioner or you see cooperative extension. Um, but it can lead to death of trees and other kinds of symptoms um, and eventual uh, plant death. So uh, sudden oak death has been moving through California over the years. This map shown here is from 2013, and I'm gonna show you a map that I uh, got off this website today. Um, it is um, uh, uh, a lot of the infection is found in the coastal areas, but we've seen some movement to the inland of California as well. Um, there are many areas that are still free from the disease, but the, the disease is moving. And again, here is the website for more information, suddenoakdeath.org. So here's a map of the situation today. And as you can see, it has, uh, the disease is spreading um, mainly the coast, but it's coming inland. You can see in the, the foothills area and even into Inyomono um, counties, there's uh, at least a case and moving down into Southern California more. Um, it's projected that it's going to move up the coast of Oregon and Washington uh, in the next few years. So something to um, be aware of. Moving quickly on to another pest, um, the invasive shot hole borer, also called the polyphagous shot hole borer. Um, it's a, uh, a, a very small insect. There's, there's a couple species, so they're called the invasive shot hole borers. <clears throat> they're very small. Um, boring beetles. They are very hard to see. They get into the wood and what they do is they carry in their mouth parts a fungus that they then cultivate in the in the plant and they feed on the fungus while they're in the plant. And <clears throat> this causes stress and disruption of the tree and will lead to dieback of branches and eventually the tree. Um, Many bark beetles in California attack dead or diseased or already compromised trees that may already be dying. And that's kind of part of the natural ecosystem that as a tree is dying, you know, insects will feed on it and, you know, they end up breaking it down. And so that's, that's natural. These beetles actually attack healthy trees. And, um, and so they are more invasive and um, not really part of our natural ecosystem when they're attacking healthy trees that could live for many years longer. They also have quite a large host range, the uh, invasive shot hole borers, and so they are a problem um, in California because we do have a lot of trees. So you can see this map here, which um, this is the most up-to-date map I could find from 2016, but we do know that the beetle is moving through California and it is moving largely on firewood as people may be uh, bringing firewood as they camp or they move from one place to another. These beetles are very hard to find, are hard to see. And so they may be inside uh, firewood and then they get introduced into a new area. So it's very important that we don't move firewood. You buy firewood where you are going to use it so that you're not introducing new species in new areas. Uh, there's also a website for this. If you find, um, or if you think you find Polifica shot hole bore reported to your county ag commissioner or UC Cooperative Extension. Uh, another pest that has currently limited range, but it's still um, something we're having to keep an eye out for is the Mediterranean oak borer. This is also really similar in its appearance to the Polifica shot hole borer. 
Um, and it's called an ambrosia beetle. That's just the type of beetle it is. Um, but they are, we are starting to find the Mediterranean oak borer in some counties in California. It's been found in Napa, California, Lake County, and Sonoma. And recently, uh, just last year or the year before, it was also found in um, a region in Sacramento County. So this is something we're keeping our eyes out for. Um, we will share a resource for the Mediterranean oak borer as well. But there are uh, different signs and symptoms that you can see on the tree. If you don't see the beetle, you can still see signs of some sort of damage that can alert you to uh, looking for what might be causing it. And once you find that out, it's easier to um, find uh, management solutions. Uh, very briefly, Japanese beetle. We hear a lot of people talk about Japanese beetle. Uh, Japanese beetle is not really in California um, as people think it is. Uh, Japanese beetle is only in a couple spots in Sacramento and Los Angeles, and this is one pest that is under uh, eradication efforts by the California Department of Food and Agriculture. Here is the uh, picture of a, a Japanese beetle, and you can see it has this, you know, iridescent green, but then it's got this rust colored um, wings here and these white tufts, but it's also really small, um, smaller than people think. We do have a, a native or an endemic uh, beetle that looks similar, and this is called the green fruit beetle, the, the fig eater beetle. Fig beetle has many different common names, but as you can see, the size difference between the two is quite significant. The green June beetle, fig beetle, fig eater beetle um, is um, quite large, right? You see them flying, they're around compost a lot, they feed on uh, ripe fruit. And the Japanese beetle is um, like a third of its size and feeds on very different foods. So um, identifying that you have the green June beetle instead of a Japanese beetle is important. But if you do find the Japanese beetle, you can report it to um, the uh, California Ag Commissioner or the CDFA pest hotline. <clears throat> um, one new pest I want to talk about, um, we've gotten a lot of questions in the last couple of months about this new worm. It has several different common names, but the most common of the common names are jumping worm or crazy worm. And that's because of its uh, behavior. These worms look a lot like regular earthworms, but as regular earthworms kind of move around a little bit and they might have a, a little bit of a jolt when they're disturbed, these jumping worms, they thrash around when they're disturbed quite um, uh, energetically, different from an earthworm, but they do have the reddish brown color. Um, and so they can be easily um, confused with an earthworm, but their movement, and also they have a very large and distinct mouth, um, they can, that <laughs> helps you distinguish them from a regular native earthworm. Um, these worms have recently been reported in a couple of California counties, mostly in um, nurseries. Uh, they might be in the soil or under the pots. And so CDFA is looking into this pest distribution. We are awaiting um, a determination of uh, the pest rating, whether it's going to be a quarantine pest, eradication efforts, or it's just something to keep our eyes out for. So please do keep your eye out for these jumping um, or crazy worms. And if you find one, again, rec uh, report it to your local ag commissioner. Um, UCIPM doesn't have information on this worm yet. So if you want to find out more, um, you can do a, a search engine search for uh, jumping crazy worm, Oregon. They are um, established in Oregon and they have some really good identifying information on their website. And, and we'll include that link um, in the follow up with you. Okay, I want to talk about another um, newer pest to California. This pest has been here for a couple of years. And these slides don't look like my other slides because I borrowed them from a colleague. Uh, the plum bud gall mite, which is hard to say five times fast, is a new um, pest that attacks a few different types of um, uh, stone fruit plants. Um, this mite was first reported in uh, sort of the Morgan Hill area, um, Santa Clara County, 
and um, around the San Jose area. And it's been identified in, in a few different um, cities in that area and also in Alameda and San Mateo County. And we have some colleagues who have been um, doing research and outreach on its spread to try and, and limit the spread. So um, it's also called the almond uh, bud gall mite or plum bud gall mite. And you can see these pictures of galls that form on the branches, either at the nodes or in, in other places. And so this is a, an exotic and invasive plant. It comes from you know, another area and it was likely introduced um, on plant material that was, was shipped here, um, but we don't quite know yet. Um, and it's a really, really small mite. It doesn't look like the kind of mites that you um, might see kind of crawling around in the backyard. It is not a spider mite, so it doesn't cause webs. Um, this is a mite that's in the areophyid mite group. And so they're microscopic. This is a, a, a digital microscopic enlargement of, of the mite. Um, they only have two pairs of legs and they're cylindrical. So again, different than um, spider mites. And you need a really high powered lens in order to see the details. Um, but I do have a picture where you can see them within a, a, a gall. But what they do is they feed on the plant and it causes the plant to produce a gall. And then you can see. So here's a cross section of a gall. And <clears throat> the gall is you know small on the plant. So when you cut it open, all these white bits, those are the mites. And so this is a really close up picture of, of the gall with the mites inside. So for more information on this, we, we have a resource to share with you as well. So if you're growing uh, plum or apricot or some of those stone fruits that is a host, um, you should look for this, especially if you're in the um, San Jose or Bay area and um, take precautions not to uh, spread it. So just really quickly, I want to talk about invasive weeds, and um, we will get more into that in part two or three. <clears throat> but there are a lot of potentially invasive weeds that can escape from our, our gardens and our aquatic areas and our landscapes. And how they escape, because weeds don't pick up and walk away themselves, but they, they move through plant parts. Either <clears throat> they can move as bits of plants on lawnmowers or other kind of gardening equipment, or they can creep and, and um, spread out from landscape to landscape or you know, wildland areas, or they can be moved by, by seeds. Uh, some seeds are moved by birds, some seeds blow in the wind, some seeds attach themselves to dogs and animals and um, other kinds uh, are clothes and they can move that way. So that's how these weeds might escape from one area to another. And there's a long list of invasive weeds that <clears throat> either um, have invaded an area or that people still buy in retail stores and plant them in their landscapes, not knowing that they are an invasive plant. Um, and so we have uh, partnered with Plant Right and the California Invasive Plant Council and other invasive um, plant uh, agencies to try and get the word out about what are invasive plants and what you can plant instead of, of buying something that's invasive. Um, I'll get to that resource in a minute, but in addition to these terrestrial plants, there are aquatic plants that can quote unquote escape from where they uh, were kept in the first place, where they were uh, put in the first place and they can get into our, our natural systems. So <clears throat> people who have plants in an aquarium or in a pond or some other water garden feature in their landscape, sometimes if that water goes into a, a regular water body, it can carry the growing structures or seeds of these um, non-native aquatic plants into our natural waterways and then they can really take off. So there's also a, a fairly long list of aquatic invasive plants as well, such as water hyacinth and uh, water milfoil and, and others. Um, and you'll see if you are a boater or someone who likes water sports, when you go to different water bodies, uh, there will be signs about wiping down your boat either before you get in or after you leave 
so that you're not introducing or taking with you any of the aquatic um, uh, plants or some of those, um, those mussels that I talked about very early on. So uh, back to the, uh, the plant right program. So they have put a list together of some of the invasive plants. And in this case, I have a picture of the invasive grasses. So something that we know is invasive, but somebody may want to plant in their landscape because it looks nice. There are alternative plants that look similar to something that's invasive that we don't want you to plant. And instead, here are some other great choices that will do well in the same kind of conditions, but do not have invasive um, uh, tendencies towards them. And so Plant Right has a long list on their website of different plants that one can, can find in retail stores um, and plant instead of something that has invasive potential. So I wanna talk about a few uh, pests that are not in California yet, but we wanna keep our eyes out for them. You've heard of some of these. Um, and so we wanna make sure that they don't get into California and don't become established. And then I'll talk about some resources. So I'm sure by now you've all heard about the murder hornet, um, more uh, correctly named the Asian giant hornet. <clears throat> uh, the Asian giant hornet or AGH um, is a very large hornet, which is a type of wasp. It is the world's largest hornet. It is usually uh, an inch and a half to two inches in length. And I will show you a visual comparison with some of the other hornets and wasps um, in the next slide or two. But it has a, a really big head. And I, I love the picture of this one because these are the antennae right here in the, the lower left. But the, the first segment of the antennae make it look like it's mad. You know, it's kind of like eyebrows. So it looks very menacing. Um, and it is rather menacing because look at these mouth parts. They are really big and their bite is very painful. Um, and so these uh, murder hornets, they are known to chop the heads off of honeybees and um, they can decimate a whole colony of honeybees. And so that's not good for um, you know, our, our uh, uh, pollinator population and um, honeybees in general. Um, and they, they form very large colonies. They, less, they nest in the ground. Um, and they have other features that distinguish it from other uh, native and, um, and other wasps. So we've had lots of reports since the murder hornet was first to hit the airwaves of people who have uh, thought that they had the, the murder hornet. <clears throat> so AGH, here it is in the middle. You can see how large it is. And this is four centimeters, not four inches. Um, but some of the lookalike species, there are other um, uh, wasps in the Vespa uh, uh, genus that are similar but different. And this is a resource from Washington State. As I said, this wasp is not yet found in California. We've not had a confirmed sighting in California. So Washington is uh, keeping their eye on it. But we want to make sure that you know there are other lookalikes. One of the uh, lookalikes that we get um, samples of or pictures of more is the cicada killer because it is also large and it does have some of the similar markings. Um, so we want to make sure that um, you don't kill every wasp that you see. There are different species of cicada killers and um, these are beneficial insects and so we don't want to um, necessarily kill them. Oops. And you can see the, the size difference. Uh, the the uh, females are larger than the males. So just because something is small doesn't mean it's a different species. It's really the, the markings and coloration um, and other features that determine the species. Um, so uh, again, if you find one, uh, call up your local cooperative extension or county ag commissioner. The next one uh, to talk about is the spotted lantern fly. This is not a true fly like a house fly. Um, so the word lantern fly is squished together. Um, it is a plant hopper, and that's a, a certain kind of um, sucking insect. <clears throat> 
So the spotted lanternfly has these beautiful colors. It's a really large insect. So here you can see the insect covering this tree. Each one of these is a, a different lanternfly. And so they can be quite invasive in an area. Um, right now they're, they're mostly found back east and we have not seen them in California yet, but we are keeping our eye out because they do have a large host range and they can cause problems to our crops. And so we don't want them to come into California or be introduced to California and cause economic damage. <clears throat> so it's important not only to identify the adults, but the, uh, the younger stages, the nymphal stage. So here is a very young nymph. They're black with white dots. And as they grow before becoming an adult, they develop the red color with black and again, some dots. <clears throat> and then they will morph into the adult. So here you can see an adult and then these, these older nymphs on a, on a plant. And this is the coloration of the, the upper wings and then the hind wings. So they retain that red color in their hind wings. So keep an eye out and again, report it if you think you find one. So <clears throat> how we can help control the invasive species is very important for all of us to recognize them, but we, we want to know that invasive species are a concern and we might need to report what we see. We want to encourage our friends, family, clientele, people that you work with or know, not to plant any of those invasive weeds or invasive plants that can then get out of hand and move into our wild areas or displace our, our local flora and fauna or not be good host to our pollinators. Um, educate your community, educate your friends and family, um, and let them know, you know, hey, you wanna know about the murder hornet? You know, that's always something good to strike up a conversation. Uh, don't move firewood. Um, many of those bark beetle pests that I talked about are being moved through firewood, and there's many more that I didn't have a chance to get to. So don't move firewood, buy it where you plan to burn it, and uh, stop the spread of those because they can kill a lot of trees in California before their time. And as I've said in almost every slide, if you find something that you think is an invasive pest, um, you can look into it yourself and you can also call your local master gardeners, your cooperative extension office, your county ag commissioner, or report it on the California Department of Food and Agriculture pest hotline. And there are resources for you to educate yourself on more invasive pests, um, <clears throat> insects, weeds, mussels, uh, diseases. There's a great resource um, that's based at UC Riverside. It's the Center for Invasive Species Research. They do have a lot of descriptions and pictures of these plants and some, uh, excuse me, pests and some of the maps that uh, can help you know if you're in an area where this pest has been established or found. And then you can learn more about the invasive pests. Um, and so here's uh, you know, some of their entries and you click on them and you can read more information. I really wanna know more about uh, rock snot. That seems like a very interesting pest that I had not heard of before. Uh, so you can find that out and how not to move it. It doesn't sound good. And the University of California Integrated Pest Management website, we do have information on exotic and invasive pests on our website as well where um, you can go and find um, the insects, the snails and slugs, um, the plant diseases, weeds, and vertebrate pests. And if you click on those, then you'll go to find more resources um, and information. <clears throat> Our group, the Urban and Community Group, we put uh, out um, some uh, newsletters we previously published the Retail Nursery and Garden Center newsletter, but we've now um, retired that newsletter and replaced it with a new one, which is on my next slide. But all of our issues of the Retail um, Nursery and Garden Center IPM news are still on our website. We'll share that website in our follow-up email. And we have covered over the last decade different invasive pests, things to keep your eye out for. So here's that spotted lanternfly again. Um, here's another garden snail. And we feature these, these articles to help alert folks to the potential for these pests to either come in or spread more and what you can do about them. So we are regularly talking about invasive pests. Here is the, the new newsletter 
Uh, we've had one issue so far, it's the Home and Garden Pest Newsletter. You can subscribe to this for free and we send it out three times a year. Here's the QR code. If you wanna put your camera up and take a picture, you can um, uh, read the issue or subscribe to it. Um, and so in each of our issues, we're going to have an invasive pest spotlight. <clears throat> so one that I didn't get a chance to talk about today is also a new pest called the black fig fly, but you can read about it in our newsletter and on our website. And it's a, a pest of figs that is, is fairly new to California. Uh, so subscribe to that and you'll get information faster than going to look for it. Here's that picture of the nutria that I promised. Look at those teeth. Those are those are really special. So um, we do have a blog as well where we share articles from our newsletter and also other articles um, uh, about certain invasive uh, species and, and other musings that, that we have um, and resources from the UCIPM program. So don't worry about writing all of these uh, resources down. We will include them in the follow-up email, but there are many different groups that are uh, looking into invasive species, either um, by doing research, education, uh, a hotline to report them, um, and uh, you know, uh, trying to uh, protect in, um, the endemic species or endangered species in California and our native flora and fauna. So lots of different agencies working together uh, to help um, combat these invasive pests. Thank you, Carrie, and thank you everyone for joining us today.